Hello and welcome to Talking Development. This special edition is brought to you from Rome, where I spent the day at the World Food Program, the world's largest humanitarian organization, whose mission is to end global hunger. I'm thrilled to be joined today by my good friend and fellow Swede, Carl Skow, who is the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of World Food Program. With more than 330 million people facing severe hunger today, our task is daunting. As new crises emerge, each more severe than the last, we are reminded of the importance of working together to achieve better and faster results, anticipate crisis, and make a meaningful impact on the lives of the people we are here to serve. This is why I'm so glad to have this conversation today on how our organizations can work closer to step up to the challenge and deploy our comparative advantages. So Carl, great to be with you in Rome here at the headquarters of the World Food Program. Really enjoyed uh, the visit today with our teams and uh, really welcome again to this uh, episode of Talking Development, my video series. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions and uh, feel free to ask me a question if you want. But I do wanna start with this one and it's of course a serious one. What is the state of the global food security situation at this moment? Well, we are really at, at record levels. Uh, I think uh, the latest number is somewhere around 330 million people food insecure, people who don't know where uh, to get the next uh, meal. And this is historically record levels, but we're now trying to address that with much less uh, resource. Uh, I mean, these numbers are driven by COVID, which uh, you know, threw us back several years in terms of progress on the SDGs. Uh, on climate and mm. how climate uh, change is having a, a compounding impact, but also uh, uh, to a large degree by conflict. I mean, only mm. this year, uh, Sudan and now uh, Gaza. And so I think, uh, you know, our estimate is that around 70, 75 percent of uh, the needs are driven uh, by these political dynamics that result in conflict. That's pretty daunting. And it does feel like we've been in sort of one crisis after the other. But I know that one of the objectives of the World Food Programme is also to build food systems for resilience. So how do you go from crisis to resilience? It's not a linear issue that we do one mm -hmm. and then we move over to the other. We always want, mm -hmm. uh, as we respond to emergencies, we want to play the way for resilience and I for uh, recovery. For us, the executive director has set out an agenda for reform in terms of addressing this increasing gap that I spoke about mm -hmm. between the needs and the resources. Part of that is that we need to diversify our funding base, so we need to, you know, to mobilize more money and money in a different way, where we're also looking at how to work with the World Bank and other financial institutions. Mm -hmm. The second is that we need to get further on every dollar, the efficiency effectiveness uh, agenda, if you will, and that hasn't been as central in the past that it is now. And so we are turning every stone uh, in terms of how we can get further uh, in supporting countries and communities uh, mm -hmm. on food security. Mm -hmm. And the third one is really around solutions. I mean, we can't only be playing catch up in terms of addressing right. emergencies. I wanted to ask you, which food insecurity situation do you worry the most about today? Well, it's hard to pick, frankly, because of that um, uh, limited resource that I spoke to. We are now going through a serious prioritization yeah. effort where we are cutting, uh, you know, funding rations. Uh, people from uh, our support program. So in Afghanistan, for example, you know, we've gone from 15 million uh, last year into 3 million now. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the latest assessment is that the people uh, either acute food insecure or frankly famine levels, adding to that women with more than five children, that category alone is 7 million people. Mm. And so just being able to reach three out of that seven means that you have four million in that category that we are not able to reach and there's no one else to reach them either. And so, you know, visiting these countries where we're going through these dramatic cuts, whether it's in Afghanistan, uh, in the DRC or in Syria or Yemen, uh, which is another, you know, we are having to make very, very uh, difficult choices. Now, my fear is that down the road we're going to see, you know, some serious uh, impact of that and we will have to be again playing catch up, uh, as I said, because the reason why we didn't have a big famine in Afghanistan last year was uh, because of our uh, intervention to address and to reach uh, 15 million people. Yeah. But if you ask me today, of course, it's Gaza. Mm. I just come back from Gaza. And so uh, and you know where this ends, uh, the complexity, uh, the speed and the gravity of the situation there is, is, is frankly unprecedented. 
it must be very hard to prioritize in such a situation where you have all these people in need and you know you don't have the means to be able to provide. But I guess it does suggest this point you made, which is you have to build, you have to work both on the food security provision or food provision, mm. but also on building resilience, building systems. And then of course partnerships, because no one uh, agency organization can essentially do it alone. But I can only imagine how difficult that might be. We have worked very closely um, together on social protection. It mm. seems to be one of the effective ways of uh, ensuring that uh, basic needs are met, including mm. food. And it also usually has the added impact of being able to be very targeted so that you know you're delivering to those who need it the most. How do you think of uh, social protection systems here at the World Food Programme? What are some of the features that you look for when you're mm. trying to transfer support through a social protection system or a social safety net? Well, I think this is also where we meet uh, Bank and, and WFP because you're in the business of eradicating extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of eradicating hunger. And frankly, social protection mm -hmm. system has proven very effective in addressing both. Uh, what we bring to the table is this uh, deep field presence you know we have uh, we are known for being uh, where you need to be uh, and getting uh, getting mm -hmm. stuff done and so i think that's also what we translate into the work of of social protection we use our digital digital and, and technology systems uh, uh, that can provide uh, uh, an architecture for that but also uh, you know transparency and, and assurance that we actually reach those we intend to reach. Interesting you mentioned digital. You know, we we um, recently did a midterm review of our strategy for fragile and conflict-affected countries, and we really found that digitalization is, in many ways, an investment in building resilience. Because one reason that there's been a lot of funds being able to be channeled through uh, to Ukraine, for example, for social mm. services, for social safety nets, for pensions, is that there was a very robust digitalized system. So the yeah. money can sort of be followed from the Ministry of Finance where it arrives to the beneficiary that's supposed to receive it quite transparently and through electronic verification. So mm. it's actually been super helpful. Great, well, you do incredibly important work and um, in a very difficult time, but I like how you think about it not as a sequential mm. problem, but really mm. something you have to do at the same time as you're addressing a crisis. You're also building mm. systems and building resilience, and uh, we're very grateful for the partnership. And I'd be keen maybe to ask you then, uh, you having you know really worked with governments uh, always as kind of you know the cornerstone, yeah. um, how could we work better together uh, with governments, WFP, uh, World Bank and governments together from the beginning rather than being the bank and the WFP coming to the government mm -hmm. with something for offer. How, how, how can we change that modus because, and, 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 and really bring mm -hmm. in from the start mm -hmm. uh, those uh, who we uh, you know, aim to support? Yeah. No, it's a great point. We cannot ignore the need to build government capacity even when it's difficult. Mm. Because if you um, decide to work completely outside of government systems, first of all, there's many things that only the state can do. What we have found is that it's very helpful to have a country platform approach with the government in the driver's seat. Mm. So they bring all the partners around the table, whether it's multilateral development institutions, UN agencies, even CSOs, local or international, so that we can really think about how do we work together to address this problem and make sure that we really focus on the government ownership and involvement and building that capacity so that we don't end up in a situation where services can be delivered, yes, but we're not building any capacity. That's my biggest fear, that mm. we leave um, a project when it's finished and we haven't really left any capacity building or any in improvements behind mm. because ultimately good development needs strong institutions and we need to really focus on that. And if I may then take the advantage of having you here on a on prevention. I mean, yeah. part of this also moving forward needs to be that we do better on prevention. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we can't keep seeing these numbers of food, people in food insecure going yeah. up or, you know, more conflict, more climate yeah. uh, uh, impact. So, so how do we work better on how do we work better on prevention? Together? It's really hard. You know, I think it's the hardest part of our uh, fragile and conflict affected state strategy. We have four pillars. This is the first pillar, if you will. And it's really hard. You know, diagnostics are helpful. Um, 
looking at sort of the drivers for fragility is very helpful. But we have decided we need to work now to develop a more robust predictability tool. The, the drivers of food insecurity needs to be a big part because we know that it is definitely a cause for conflict and fragility. So we look forward to working together with you and many others on this, but we do feel we need a better predictability tool to take this forward because the prevention side is so important. Well, great. And again, uh, thank you for being here. I know that, you know, uh, the past two, three, four years, if you will, and you know, our partnership has really solidified and, and deepened. Uh, but I feel that today we have though managed to kind of look ahead and I'm excited uh, to see how we can take this beyond what we're already doing and, and get ourselves into new areas uh, of collaboration. So again, um, thank you for being here and it's been a, a great day. Thank you and thank you for having us. It's been great to be here together. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining me today. Here is my take. In this new turbulent development era, where sadly crises and shocks are becoming the norm, we need to address hand-in-hand -hand global challenges like climate change, food insecurity and conflict, each reinforcing the other. And we must invest in prevention, social safety net systems, and put resilience at the center of global food security. I'm looking forward to the next phase of our partnership with the World Food Programme. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on Talking Development.